everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms. The entire universe might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist Podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello everybody, all you people out there. Welcome to yet another iteration of the Simulationist Podcast. This is number 41, iteration 41, and today is June the 16th when we're recording this. You will probably be listening to this tomorrow or later, so hello. Um, and uh, I am Josh Trelevin, and with me as always on the other side of the table is your faithful co-host, Ryan Kirkby. Okay. Hey, Ryan. Uh, let's see, how are you doing this week? I'm doing pretty good, especially given that uh, yesterday was free RPG day, and today is Father's Day, so it's my first Father's Day. Uh, well, okay, technically my second Father's Day, if you include when my wife was pregnant with my well, with our daughter, but it really doesn't count because you don't get any presents that way. I, yeah, I guess it's kind of semantics. Are you a father if you have an unborn child, I guess? Well, there's some interesting follow-through as to what that means. I don't know if we want to discuss all the ramifications <laughs> of that here and now. Um, yeah, it might be better to to wait on actually calling yourself a father until everything follows through as it's you know supposed to. You're not a father <laughs> until you've changed a diaper at least once. Hey, there's a nice legal definition of fatherhood. Yeah, um, I like that. Well, you know, I might become a father one day, and I might not ever change it. No, I probably won't be able to get away with it. <laughs> Tell you what, I'll meet you halfway. You'll change diapers, but I'll see what I can do about finding out those big gloves that go right up to the elbow <laughs> for you. Those big, like, mad scientists, you know, thick, you know, plastic gloves for you. Hmm. Uh, I'm still searching for myself. <laughs> no, I, that sounds worse. I, I'd rather, you know, have just be able to wash the hands and, and not have to throw things like big gloves in, away or wash Well, I wouldn't even things. throw the gloves away. You'd just wash yeah, them. Wash the you know, like the industrial gloves you use when you're like washing dishes at a place. Um, I don't know where... <laughs> I guess it is Father's Day so we talk about fatherly topics like changing diapers. Um, That's just how it naturally <laughs> evolves you when you've got a young child. Eventually it all winds up at the diaper. Yeah, and uh, I guess, you know, future Father's Day for you will be cooler like, um, you know, Father's Day. What do you do? Watch it. Take your kid to the movies for Father's Day. Mm-hmm. Well, like technically, you. they take you to yeah, the movies yeah, for Father's Day. Uh, although I must admit, technically, I got what I really wanted this Father's Day, which was a nap. <laughs> <laughs> and that was kind of nice. That was a good person. I also got a pair of wonderful T-shirts, a Superman and a Batman T-shirt. They're nice and airy and uh, and really stylish. So you know, I can be a hip dad once again. Ooh. Cool, cool. Hey, so we should. Just segue into, um, or as you say, seg into, because you're cool and hip that way. Although, cool and hip dad, I don't think that can work, so... I'm the hippest nerd dad you'll ever see. And provided my my little Zoe winds up becoming nerdy, too. Hello from the past, Zoe. Uh, Yeah, I'll wind up being the coolest parent. Because, you know, if you're a nerd, and your kids are nerds, then you're the person that gets them all the wonderful stuff that you also enjoy reading, too. So they, yeah. oh yeah, my dad got a copy of this book, and it's like, oh my goodness. It's like, yeah, yeah, I got that for me too. You Let's go me. share some miniatures and play together. So you're gonna let her um, play with your miniatures and read your books, and yeah, you know, yeah. play with your sword collection. Uh, well, technically, I only have the one sword, and it's up <laughs> up high, uh, out of reach. Uh, it's dull too. There's no way I'm sharpening that. But uh, no, I hear I hear there's a statistic that more people are injured by dull swords and knives than by sharp ones. Well, does it include how many people wind up dying from a sharp blade? Um, I don't know if they include. I don't. I don't think that deaths are as common as just plain injuries. But okay, I'm gonna work it this way though. She's not allowed to play with my sword, but I do have a nice Thor's hammer and a set of Wolverine claws, both out of plastic. She can completely ruin at her leisure. Okay. And I think that's a nice way to, to, to make head ground. Uh, 
And besides, why play with a sword when you can just strap on Wolverine claws and go go mucking about? Think about it. Think about it. Wolverine claws, yeah, definitely awesome. Um, how did I get caught up on another conversation? <laughs> just trying to use the word segue. <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Um, I was going to ask you, like, what else have you been up to? Uh, uh, well, I, I didn't get uh, into uh, the games that I was planning on this week. Uh, I found myself... Uh, Intrigued with a, a few uh, things, uh, though. Uh, a, a wonderful new web comic. Well, it's new to me. There are almost 200 comics in. Mm -hmm. uh, you do know uh, Order of the Stick, correct? Uh, I know that one. So you're not saying that's the one you've discovered? No, no. I've okay. known that one for a while. Uh, and it's wonderful. It's uh, a really good one, yeah. But we it's, all it, love it. it's a similar style, uh, our artistic style and frame. It's called uh, Servants of the Imperium. And it's a uh, Warhammer 40k uh, comic strip. Uh, they're not allowed to use Space Marines because Games Workshop will sue anyone to the ground that tries that. <laughs> uh, but they are showing a very interesting take on the world, uh, especially from the more personal level, not from the giant army sized thing. I'm yep. quite liking it. This is very well done. And I encourage people that have a little spare time and a blank list on their you know, web comics list to give, give it a try. So, in, in just in case people don't, I think most of our listeners probably do know what 40, Warhammer 40k is, and they can look it up. If they don't. In the grim dark future of the 40,000, there is only war, and such yeah. and so forth. So it's it's, it's a war game uh, system. You know, you play your little minis, you move them across the map as you try and eliminate the other side, and you can be any sorts of various races. They have orcs, space orcs. They have two different kinds of space elves. They've got humans. Uh, Evil humans. They've got uh, horrible beasts that will eat a planet bare, yeah, and, and all sorts of like zombie Necron things. That wonderful stuff. Very good, good artwork too. So if you ever want to get some nice inspiration, take a look at some of their art. Little grim, but very nice. Yeah, this is one of these games that you basically sink all of your disposable income into because and <laughs> time. Because unless you're doing uh, something like like the orcs, you can't just spray paint the base green and then do highlights for other colors. Hmm. Uh, these are things people will spend a lot of time and effort making sure all the decorations are beautifully done. If you go to uh, uh, any of your local gaming conventions that have multiple game genre types, uh, they will likely have it there. I encourage everyone to give it a look-see. It's beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. And kind of fun just to sit and watch two people move armies about and kill each other tactically. So, cool. It's a good webcomic. Uh, nicely done. I'm not all the way through uh, the archives at this point, but I'm liking what I... Uh, I'm so what is it called again? Sorry. Servants of the Imperium. Of the Imperium. Yes. Does it have a name attached to it? Like, do you know the artist? or um, We can add it to well, the show notes later. No, actually, I don't know the artist at this point. I'm just, I am just heard the thing. It's like, it's kind of like this. Uh -huh. You know, it's just like, you know, there was such a long delay for a while there on Order of the Stick. You know, I started yeah. looking, and then I found one thing. It's like that, and so I put it in my files. Come back later, and then unfortunately, my come back later file of save stuff is so long and so you know horribly <laughs> convoluted. It took me a while to get around to it, and uh, I came to it this week, and I'm really impressed. Oh, that's good. That's good. So you've been basically reading the all the whole 200 strips. Did you get through them all? Uh, I'm at about 130 right now. Okay. Uh, well, that's because was, you know, like I said, it was free RPG day yesterday. Uh, yeah. And my wife managed to pick up something for me because my work hours were exactly the same as the local friendly neighborhood comic book store. Mm. And so it would have been uh, either impossible or negligent for me to have gone there. I would have had to have taken a 15-minute break and driven like crazy to get there, come in, snagged it, and run off, and maybe maybe would have come back late. for. So the closest place. comic book store to where you live in town... Well, there was only the one in town that was participating. Oh, okay. Uh Despite the fact we have many wonderful uh, little gaming stores here and there uh, throughout Victoria, only one was participating in uh, the free com RPG day, and that was Curious Comics at both their locations. Oh, okay, yeah. So my wife managed to pick me up uh, the Shadowrun, most recent edition, uh, with the quick start rules and a nice little adventure on the other side. Very nice thing. And I just I fell back in love with Shadowrun all over again, just, just oh, browsing good, through good. it. Uh, I used to play it all the time. It'd be... Uh, I come home, I, you know, for the summer, you know, from university. And I'd be working till about eleven o'clock at night. Go home, clean myself up, meet my friends, you know, just a little after midnight, and then we'd play Shadow Run till five to six in the morning. And then we'd all go home, sleep until late in the afternoon, and then oh, we all go to work again and repeat. 
Now, I want to ask you this. Do you see Shadowrun as um, a futuristic setting or a retro setting? Well, a little bit of both. Uh, because, well, it started in 1989, and so it was the future in, like, the year 2060. Okay. But technology progresses on at a faster pace than anybody anticipated, and in ways nobody could anticipate. Yeah. So the whole concept of, of you know, jacking into the, the Matrix and... And hmm. doing things online with your... It, they had uh, nice cyber decks that were like the size of a keyboard and you basically strap it around like you're playing like a keyboard and you do all that sort of stuff while you're in the Matrix. Which, by the way, came in before the Matrix movie. So, you know, if you're going to ask who ripped off who for names, now you know. It was the person that came in second that was, did the ripping. Yeah, but when was the... Well, I'm, I'm sure the the Matrix, they, they couldn't have... Let's see... Shadowrun yeah, yeah, yeah. couldn't have stolen it from the people who wrote The Matrix because that obviously didn't they come out. Came, the first edition came out a decade before the but movie. Yeah, my impression of the film, though, is that it was in the works for a long time before it actually came out. So it may have actually had a genesis around the same time as the Shadowrun Yes, setting. well, to be fair, there's a lot of people using the, the cyberpunk future setting and what goes on with the, the future of computers. Yeah, well, it might be yeah. the same sort of deal as Space Marine. It's like, the person who used it first, yeah, maybe, that's sure, but by now it's just so everybody uses it. So. Well, not if Games Workshop has their say. They'll but sue people well, that try and use it, despite the fact <laughs> they did not coin the term by any stretch of the means. Do, do we know the outcome of that whole thing? Though? Uh, they usually get shot down, but it is prohibitively expensive to fight them because they've got money, lawyers, and time, which is the three things you need to win a lawsuit. I, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't spend that kind of money just over a term. I On the other hand, uh, there are people now that, like uh, with the Electronic Frontier Foundation and uh, the wonderful people at the Popat website that will uh, give uh, legal work pro bono in this oh, yeah. case yeah. to defend uh, you know the the common man from these big corporations suing, and so that really helps take the edge off. You get good lawyers, and it doesn't cost you as much money. Then all you have to do is be prepared to hunker down for the length of time it takes mm -hmm. to get through the legal system. Yeah, uh, hopefully you have the side project in the works, and <laughs> so that you're not sitting and not right producing any content. Yeah, sure. well that's the thing is if you can always use it to learn because honestly I would be kind of intrigued for an RPG that works as, as like a law and order type setting okay mm uh, if if anyone out there works for law and order there's something to do for your next series you don't have to put five series on TV have four series on TV and come up with an RPG <laughs> it'll be a blast trust me yeah well and well I honestly most of the rule books you could print would just be the legal text the legal text <laughs> so you know there's there's some cheap resources already out there for you yeah, but uh, but yes, as technology has progressed on, and you're able to do so much more stuff than anybody had anticipated, uh, it has a retro feel to it now. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Uh, the guns are strictly old school style, whereas if you look at the next generation of weaponry being designed by by the militaries of the world, they're clearly different. So the real world of 2020 is going to be a lot different than the Cyberpunk 2020 game ever was, or any of its follow-through, such as Shadowrun. Um, that said, Shadowrun's still going to have trolls, orcs, elves, and dwarves, and I don't think the future I in reality is going to have them <laughs> to the same style. So, you know, take from that what you will. Uh, yeah, but yes, I have fallen in love with the system again, and I may have to get you in on it because it's a nice set, uh, setting where you can play with a group of one person. Okay, well, yeah, I'm up for that. So I know you've tried it before, but uh, we didn't do too much on that. Yes, I pl I played Shadowrun one time. I can't even remember what my character my character's name was. Steve Lamer. Yes, you were an elf, if I recall. Probably an elf, yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, we stopped a convenience store robbery. <laughs> Give or take, stopped one. But, uh, yeah, it's a fun thing with uh, Shadowrun. It doesn't have to be the big campaign star arcs. You don't have to save the universe. Sometimes it's like, dude, you're getting food. People are robbing the place. Do you choose to, <laughs> to you know, open up, you know, and go fully, you know, automatic with your gun on the people trying to rob it so that you can get to the front of the line and pay for your chips. Yeah, well, yeah, this is what I'm always saying. You just need tension. It doesn't have to be world-shaking, although that's cool, too. But yeah. 
Well, the thing is, is you can make an adventure in Shadowrun just based off of going to a, a, the laundromat in a particularly dangerous part of futuristic Seattle. And that, yeah, you can mm-hmm. gain karma, kill people, loot bodies, uh, while you're waiting for your uh, laundry to dry. Yeah. So, you know, that's a nice thing about it. And it's not a level-based system either, which is always nice to take a break from. It's point by. Oh, yeah, yeah, that. sure. So it, it feels a little different when you play, I've noticed, than, than if you're doing a level-based thing. Yeah. The stats matter a little bit more. Your gear matters a little bit more. You can't just realize, like, okay, no, no, they're first level mooks, and I'm level 15 here, baby. There's still a chance that, that uh, low-end street punk with the... Uh, with the tiny little pistol, will wind up actually hurting you. <laughs> it's The chances are progressively less likely, but it's always there, which I think is a nice reflection of reality. Uh, some punk with a gun can wind up hurting you, no matter how go- good you are at everything. Yep. Street Line Special brings down another runner. Bam! Plus, I kind of like the lingo sometimes. A fake futuristic lingo people wind up using is always fun. I may have to I may yeah, I may have to invest in some time and effort to get more of the novels for both settings. Just from what I've read, I, I, I want to experience more in one fashion or another. I want to experience this fiction across many different medias. Yeah, well, that's a good way to uh, yeah to get into it. And I suddenly kick myself in the behind for ever giving away the Shadowrun game back for the uh, the Sega Genesis. Hmm. Ah, the follies of my youth. But how about you, Josh? How about you this week? What have you been up to? Oh, uh, what? Yeah, what have I been up to? Playing uh, video games, of course. Um, one of the things I did was just out of um, what? Out of whim, I guess is that um, in Minecraft, in the game of Minecraft, the villagers um, don't drop anything when you kill them. Like, And I think that's on purpose, because they don't want players... They want to Discourages want to looting sprees, yes. But the thing, the other... The problem with that is that in Minecraft, there are zombies everywhere. Like, zombies are the main bad guy, and they're, yeah, they're everywhere. Literally everywhere uh, at night. Well, everywhere it's dark, which is everywhere. Except for mushroom life. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah, there's no zombies in Mushroom Island. Um, so, uh, what I did... Oh, uh, the other thing about zombies is they have a drop. They drop a thing when you kill them. They drop rotten flesh. Oh. And so I thought to yeah. myself, well, how does flesh get rotten? And where's the, like, you know, the fresh flesh? And well, obviously that should be villagers, right? So that's human what I did. flesh. I added human flesh to the game of mine, Minecraft. So now the nice. villagers... Uh, when you kill the villagers, you get their flesh, and you can cook it up, and you can eat it, and it doesn't poison you. Okay, so how about your Steve? When your Steve dies, does he additionally drop fresh flesh, and then you can <laughs> rush back to your corpse and get your own previous flesh and then eat your own old body? Uh, uh, well, I haven't got that far in learning how to code, because the player has a different sort of... They're under yeah, a different set of rules. Different oh, okay. set of rules. So, but, yeah, once I figure that out, I'm going <laughs> to think I'll add that. Nice. Actually, in that's a nice little, uh, little, you know. Okay, you died, but here's an extra piece of item for you when you get it all back together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it, in the game, though, they do have a. I haven't figured out how to mod this in either, but they do have a, a rule that you can set to have players drop their head, and it comes oh, like you know how you. Yeah, you I remember hearing about skins. heads. Yeah. Yeah, so you can get different player heads. Uh, have you experimented with skins at all with Minecraft? Uh, I got a dwarfish appearing skin oh, and a few dwarf. background ones that I haven't gone to. One that makes me look kind of like a Slender Man. Uh, some other stuff. One that makes me look like a like a semi zombie. I don't play around with them too much. I just like my little dwarf thing because I started at Dwarf Fortress and it just feels right when I'm swinging a pick to have a beard. No, I like that you picked a dwarf because because uh, I'm a big fan of you. You may not have seen the Yogg's cast. Um, no, sadly, uh, there's so much to listen to, so much to do. Uh, there, well, I have a lot of favorite, <laughs> so I won't say they're my favorite. They're one of my favorite because I like a lot of different people on YouTube who make. You find yourself videos. going back time and again, <laughs> no. but yeah, I'm subscribed to them, and and um, one of them, his name is well, the the guy is named Simon. I can't remember his last name, 
and his avatar is called Honeydew, and he's a dwarf. And um, yeah, I, I guess people should. Do, I will put a link, and people can watch Yogg's Cast because I think they're great. Um, they do swear. Uh, the, our podcasting is not a swearing podcast, but that uh, we could devote a topic <laughs> to swears and, and critic <laughs> swears sometime. I think that would that have some nice. Uh, oh, fantasy through. swearing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Might have to uh, dust off the old explicit tag just so we can use actual swear words, but maybe we can work around it. I don't know. Well, that's, that's the thing is, is a lot of it is a way to get around with swears. Yeah. Uh, I remember the Red Dwarf with their smeg, and I remember, uh, oh, I remember Shadowrun using hoop for almost anything. Oh, okay. Our hoops are hooped! <laughs> ah! Well, we might have to save that yeah. then for a future episode. That sounds like a fun discussion. It is so fun, <laughs> I think. I, I'll do a little bit of research, make sure I've got a full list of fake swears we can go through. Yeah, that's good. But, uh, yes, um, okay. Put a pin in that, Ryan, and we'll come back later. I think that basically covers what I've been... I mean, I play lots of Minecraft all the time. Uh, all right, so i got a yeah. Minecraft question for you. Because I was going through... Because I have a nice mushroom island I'm slowly building stuff up on. Uh, nothing much to report, just... What I've, last week, what I've been doing is just moving A to B, turning stone into cobblestone into bricks, and then moving oh yeah. the dirt up to the top of my fortress area. Yeah, moving dirt around. It sounds yeah. like Minecraft. <laughs> no, nothing too <laughs> grandiose or anything yet. I um, guess I, you know, I want to keep things nice and simple. But it occurred to me, there's no monsters on the mushroom biomes. Yeah. But if you're in a town... Uh, the monsters uh, like will spawn every night, and ah, zombie swarms attack. Mm, true, yeah. So what happens if you transplant villagers to a mushroom biome? That is a good question. Um, <laughs> I think that the monsters will spawn. Ah, nerds. I think they will. However, I should, me- I should note that in the current version of Minecraft, um, I don't know what happened. It might be an accident, but they actually have disabled the um, zombie sieges, I believe. That's not bad, in my opinion, because honestly... They're uh, kind of annoying. <laughs> well, I wouldn't mind if it happens occasionally, but every freaking night, it's like, dude, I was just trying yeah. to get a few things done here in town, and now it's nightfall, and now I'm protecting people, and there's creepers everywhere. Yeah, and it, the thing is, it's very hard to protect an entire village like that. It's. I mean, it really does help if you have a bow and arrow, a nice spot to, to stand up, and a couple golems helping you out. Because the yeah. creepers don't try and blow up around the golems. The creepers hate you. They blow up around you. Yeah. Well, and, and the creepers, yeah, they don't attack the villagers either. So that No, but they're coming around by you, and then all of a sudden mm. you take the wrong corner. Creeper! Boom! Yeah. You take out two villagers. There's a nice little crater in the center of town. Water pouring out of the side of the... Uh, the fountain that they had there, the well, and then it's all your fault. Hope you feel good, hero. So, uh, the thing is, I don't know what's going to happen in the future of Minecraft. I don't know if they'll consider that a bug, or they've just decided that it's, that zombie sieges don't work. I think they may have disabled them because they weren't satisfied with the difficulty, or you know how it worked well, out. I wouldn't mind if they just make it a periodic thing. Not every night, but maybe like one in ten nights. It's that way, yeah. how long are we going to stay here and then before you, you leave for their own good? Yeah, I thought it was something like that, but I, I'm actually not sure in the exact rules. It might not Because it seemed to me like it was anyway. every dang night I tried staying at that one village. They just kept coming after me. Was this more than one update ago? or? Uh, it was back in, yeah, the previous update, major update. Two okay. rounds of bug fixes ago, I think mm-hmm. it was. So I don't know. So yeah, it could be different in the current. Or maybe I'm just so unlucky with the villages. Because the village I found yeah. didn't have enough people to actually support even a single golem. Yeah, yeah. I think you need about 20 villagers for a golem. Yeah. But it, that's also, it might be the same number or slightly larger to enable zombie sieges too. Uh, so here's the question though for you. is a... Uh, when this destruction starts happening, when you're in the town, do you try fixing up exactly as it is, or do you try making the town better? Oh, well, I'm always improving towns, because that's my big thing in Minecraft, is I love the villagers, and that's why I was playing around with villager meat. I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I never kill the villagers, but yeah. sometimes they die, you know, zombies kill them. They don't <laughs> have the <laughs> smartest AI. <laughs> yeah, they might catch on fire or something like that. Sometimes they just, you know, hide in the wrong area and it's not behind a door and the zombies come and eat them. It happens. Yeah, yeah, it happened. And I was playing around in creative mode and I was spawning villagers and then setting them on fire. Uh-huh. And 
the thing about pigs and cows and sheep and chickens is you set them on fire and they run like they they you know go crazy like oh, I'm on fire. The villagers they just stand there they're like oh whatever. Well, that's fire. The thing. that makes sense because the <laughs> villagers with their hands together always seem so peaceful like they're always somewhat meditating and then yeah. it's kind of like that that one uh, picture or video bit everyone sees of the uh, Tibetan monk who lights yeah. himself on fire <laughs> and just sort of calm yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They're like that, man. They're just so passive and serene. It doesn't matter that they're on fire. Yeah, I, and I'm okay with that. I might change the code so that they run when they catch on fire. But um, it I wouldn't hurt if they could run to the nearest source of water, maybe. Yeah, actually, that'd be good. I don't plan on lighting any more villagers on fire, except in creative mode for mm-hmm. testing purposes. Yes, yes. I don't. I don't consider that as counting. But y- I consider survival like. It counts if you kill a villager, which I've never. I don't think I've ever done. <laughs> I shouldn't speak so quickly, but <laughs> I don't think. I I've don't ever recall <laughs> doing such a thing. Um, so here's yeah. another quick question: Is I noticed with the tornado thing that I was looking at, you can oh, do a lot of additional stuff in there. Is there any way to generate a nice even mist, like like with a, a water falls and then it spreads everywhere? Is there some way to to make it like spray up and turn into a nice gentle mist to help put you out without? having the running water concerns or is that uh, beyond the code limits of the game uh, it sounds like something that would be possible and, and not too hard but I've, no, I've not seen it done before I may have to invest some time in, in hunting it down or at least begging someone to do it for me Yeah, and I've, I've thought about some certain ideas like smoke and stuff and mm-hmm. basically I was thinking you could turn water source blocks so that they work in reverse so they, the gravity is reversed so turn water into smoke and reverse the gravity, and that way if it hits like a structure upside down, like it'll flow off of it. Oh, very I think nice. That might work as smoke. That could work quite nice. I mean, just the way I'm thinking about it. Hey, is the code for the uh, the sponge blocks still in the game? Yeah, I believe you can Ooh. get them in creative mode. Um, oh, there's I might, ha- might have to have some fun with that, putting it into a real game. Oh well, I don't think they function as water. Uh, like they don't. They don't suck up water, suck up water like they did. Well, I suppose I guess it makes sense that when I first started with the alpha or the beta free version, mm-hmm. uh, every water block was a water source block. So yeah, something like that. Yeah, it works that way. Yeah. Okay. Thoughts? You know, asking uh, someone more experienced. Yeah. Ideas, ideas that just crop up. What can you do? What can you do? Uh, yeah. But yes, uh, we do have an official topic this week. That's right. Yes. We do. Yes. Is uh, through my travels, you know, throughout the various realms of fiction, I, I've noticed that there seems to be an interesting disconnect from uh, occult and, and mysterious things and uh, modern age technology. Uh, now, that's not to say there's a complete void. I mean, they're doing some wonderful things with creepy pasta about, like, uh, this version of the uh, Zelda game is corrupted and there's, like, a haunted by someone's, you know, ghost in the game. Or, you know, uh, yeah. Stephen King did Christine about a demon car. Mm, yeah. And uh, that worked out quite nice, but it, there doesn't seem to be a, uh, a nice, uh, easy way to work things together uh, the same way that you can with the occult and, and other facets of reality. Well, the occult, yeah, it seems to be Why well, I use the occult? Because I don't want to say, like, it's magic. Because it seems much more supernatural than, than actual object of magic. Uh, okay, well, yeah, uh, magic that can be manipulated by humans, like human wizards or mages, learned people. Because, I mean, I, you know, I'm sure everyone has their experience, like, what was going on with this computer? It seems <laughs> like it's possessed. What is wrong with it? Uh, and no, it turns out you got 600 viruses on there. Whoops. Yeah, well, uh, viruses can almost seem supernatural if you don't really understand. And I, personally, I don't understand a lot about computers, so viruses are kind of like behind this veil of, um, you know... This tech (laughs) barrier for you. (laughs) Technology. It's like, what's going on back there? might as well be supernatural. (laughs) But I recall a time when you were printing off something from some spam email, and uh, there was extra lines of text coming up that didn't appear on your screen, but were printed out. So that's a nice uh, use of what can seem supernatural. Something like that. Uh, I had one song file I tried to to get a hold of that would never stay on my computer. It just kept like self-erasing itself whenever you weren't actively <laughs> using it. As soon as you stopped using it, bam, it's gone. Yeah. You could search every part of the computer. It's just nowhere to be found. You didn't delete it. It deleted itself. 
And it seems that, uh, like, do you think there's a reason that, uh, that people don't seem to be as willing to connect weird, mysterious, you know, things with the cutting edge technology hmm. without just saying, oh, it must be a virus. I don't know what it is. It must be a virus. You know, scrub your computer, reboot. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think the reason is the fact, I, I mean, the reason why we don't, but, I mean, we can get by this if we need to, but the reason I think why we don't uh, ascribe um, supernatural effects to, like, technological things is because we we barely understand technology as it is. But shouldn't that make things easier? Because, I mean, a lot of this supernatural stuff, like, oh, they're ghosts, oh, they're vampires, oh, what's going on here? Well, it must be because, you know, well, they don't actually understand reality, and so they make up a story to explain reality as best they can. Shouldn't that work with the computers, which people have a huh. all-too-tragic lack of understanding as to how it operates? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe there might be people in the world. I feel like our, like, our cultural creators, like the people we look to for our stories and stuff like that, and the age we live in is much more rational and, like, especially when it comes to stories about technology, like, when we tell those stories, we always have the answer being a naturalistic explanation, like, you know, this caused that, caused that. And but that doesn't give rise to what the next thing <laughs> of vampires are about. Vampires come about because it's like, oh no, these people are sick after someone died. And it can't be because, you know, there's like a sickness going throughout everyone. It's not like this sick person got all their close friends and family sick and now they're mm -hmm. dying too. It must be that this person is back from the dead and they're trying to kill their friends and loved ones. And yeah. so they wind up staking the body and blood comes out. Oh my goodness, how can blood come out of a dead body? We never drained it of blood or anything like that, so there's no way it should be able to pool. Oh no, ah! And that's how you come up with vampires. And it's like, no, dude, yeah. it was tuberculosis. <laughs> so, Bad so you're water. saying that the mythology surrounding things like vampires and werewolves and stuff is born out of ignorance, basically. is born out of... Ignorance and imagination. Yeah, oh, sure. Although I should say that there's nothing wrong inherently with ignorance. It's when you try and stick to it, despite uh, you know the information being out there, that it becomes a problem. Ignorance yeah. itself is nothing bad. So, but so our modern myths will be born out of, uh, presumably. I mean, what we'll have to do is we'll have to either consciously create them and say, you know, this is a story which we do all the time in movies, and you know, Hollywood is based on that. It's based on although it's depending fiction. who you talk to, their mm -hmm. logical processes isn't the best. <laughs> no, no, of course not. Um, you can hack something to explode, according to to the Hollywood. They've hacked our webs. Which webs? All of them. <laughs> They're making things explode with their hacking yeah. skills. <laughs> yeah, and and well, we have we have MythBusters now, thanks to that. Who are you know they're working against that Hollywood. No, um, not everything is made out of explodium. <laughs> you can't just fire something and have it blow up. Yeah, and of course the the wonderful point that we le that we learn over and over again from MythBusters is that you can tell a really much cooler story and much better if you have more information about how things actually work. Yes. On the other hand, you know, you not delving into this new realm of mythology when you're looking at things with a logical eye. And I love the logical eye. I I was I have spent half a decade learning to develop <laughs> my logical eye. Yeah. But I don't uh I don't see what the next room, you know, group of supernatural creatures are. Uh, aside from the occasional, you know, creepy pasta out there, which is doing very nice work at this sort of stuff, they're making wonderful, horrible things every year, <laughs> and I encourage everyone out there to keep doing that because, well, that's how you you keep getting new content for all of society. Although I will feel bad when they eventually come up with a Slender Man movie because I know they're gonna not get the point of it and they're gonna botch it badly. Yeah, well, I don't know the point of it too much either. It's creepy, and some of the best things is that there aren't much of a point to it. Sometimes it's just creepy, and it's like, what the hell was that? It's just for the heck of it, yeah. Like, I remember a nice short story about, uh, it was actually nice, was, uh, people found like a weather-beaten VHS sort of thing, but oh, they, when they put it in, they were still able to play it. It shows, uh, like, someone setting up, a, you know, the tripod, you know, old-fashioned thing, and then it's, uh, you know, in a kitchen. Lady turns on uh, the stove, crawls inside of it and closes the door behind her. Uh, a couple of minutes later, you start seeing shaking and all that. You know, smoke comes out the top, and then it's 
stays still and it just keeps recording until it runs out of tape mm-hmm. and uh, the the scary thing is that uh, the area they found that in uh, they found you know a, a body in the oven nearby but it wasn't of the lady that was shown on the tape hmm. so how do you connect all these parts together it's not it's a really just a ball of hooks it's a wonderful yeah. creepy <laughs> story there's very little logical explanation for it it's got a nice technological you know aspect in there because you know who moved the tape? How's this whole thing going? What's what's affecting what? That's up for you to decide. Real nice uh, creepy pasta because I it, it, I remember reading it the first time, just thinking, "Wow, what was that? <laughs> it was great, but what was that?" No, yeah. that sounds cool. I mean, of course, there's the prototype, the the typical example of Lost, and how many people were not satisfied with like not having a proper conclusion well I think that's because of the amount of time invested this yeah. story I read was like maybe two paragraphs at most Okay, you're not going to expect a 100% resolution from a two paragraph story you, you are going to expect something out of it but not necessarily full resolution Right. you invest four seasons of time <laughs> and J.J. J. Abrams better have some freaking results or he's got himself a fist coming at his face pretty quickly sometime in the future by golly uh, not that I'm advocating violence against him. He's apparently a pretty decent guy, despite his love for uh, for some similar tactics throughout all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, you know, it, they invested four seasons. They're like, uh, how many episodes per season? They want some freaking answers. Yeah. Uh, but they weren't given. I, I believe the technical term for it uh, online is the Chris Carter effect. When you come up with a lot of decent promise for all your, your wonderful stories, saying that, oh yeah, there's a, there's a thing that hooks them all together, and then just never wrapping up all these loose ends. Hmm. Not that, you know, Chris Carter, the guy who, uh, who uh, produced uh, The X-Files and Millennium, uh, is actually the first person to do that. I remember in comic books, uh, the writer uh, Chris Claremont uh, put in so many wonderful loose ends, making a wonderful X, uh, X-Men X mythos for all this stuff, they're still tying stuff up now. It's like <laughs> 30 years later, they're still coming back to some of the loose ends and tying everything up together and, and yeah. bringing it back. Um, which I suppose is good. I mean, it's always nice to have something to work with. Yeah. Well, I, I will mention, though, like some there are uh, works of fiction which I've read. I, I've just recently listened to Hitchhiker's, not Hitchhiker, uh, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe by Douglas Adams on audiobook. And um, what I, one of the things I noticed about it, he's he likes to tie everything together. Like he, and obviously it's comedy, so he's got you know comedic license to do that. Yeah. So it's like, oh, then this is uh, why this explains this thing, and they they go back to Earth like out of some weird coincidence, they end up back at Earth like millions of years ago. Spoiler alert, by the way. But I think the book's <laughs> been out long enough. I think it's, it's well yeah. known enough. You don't have to do too much of a spoiler alert. Um, similar to Planet of the Apes, I suppose, in some ways. But um, yeah. Y- yeah, the the modern humans go back in time and and also space somehow, and it all ties back together, and they end up being their own ancestors. And it, it's, it's amusing, of course. Yeah. But it also, it's like the opposite problem of having too many loose ends it's tying everything up and say, like into a tight ball and saying everything is connected So, I or then you can do something like what Tolkien did where everything relates together it all ties up except for that one thing that like Tom Bombadil or the cats uh, <laughs> you know from the Dark Queen all that that one yeah. weird loose thread that winds up driving people nuts because it's like a beautiful tapestry with two loose ends one on this side and one on that <laughs> side and nobody knows what they're even there for or were they supposed to be there were they supposed to be trimmed what's going on yeah and I think that might be him effectively trolling his fans. I have a suspicion he put that in just because there was no answer in, in every mythology. There's one thing that just kind of stands out as a little off. <laughs> well, I will... Like, one of the things that Tolkien did when he was writing is he was always thinking about how he could... Like, when people asked him a question about the setting, like, he, he would, he would you know, create this mythology, and then people would ask him, well, what about this? Why doesn't this add up with this and make sense? And then he, from that, he would create another story to explain it. Like he'd be like, "That's oh, a good way of, of doing yeah. it. It's it's a nice way of of well, it's effectively making pearls out of sand. Is you find a little incongruity right. yeah. and you build up something from it. And oh, hey, you've got another wonderful pearl that everyone admires. Yeah, uh, a lot of people will just try and explain it away. 
he rolled with it and managed to create much more better things out of it that way. And I think it's a wonderful lesson for everybody to learn is that don't try and reject the weird little bits that, that initially don't seem right for your, your fiction. Roll with it, build with it, next thing you know, you've got one more pearl. Yeah. Well, and you can, like, you can throw things away, if you like, or put them, I guess I would say, put them to the side yeah. and say, well, I'm not sure if that really happened in this world. It might be a, somebody's myth or something. I'll just put it to the side, and later on you can come back to it if you want and say, well, that was a really cool story. It had a really cool idea in it, but I'm going to change it. I'm going to say these people remembered it wrong. And so some, you know, that they did a lot of that. Like Tolkien did a lot of that because he imagined that his setting was a real like mythology that has like a written history and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. Like well, heck, he came up with several different languages for it. Yeah, and they may have several different written histories. It's like the the books that he wrote were supposed to be similar to how the Bible is. It's like cobbled together from different sources and like hmm. so this person remembered this detail but didn't rem- didn't know about this other thing yeah so the hobbit was written by bilbo <laughs> baggins after the fact and all that so maybe yeah, yeah. maybe bilbo didn't have such a great story in there but he's the one writing it so yeah he's the hero of the day yeah and, and bilbo wrote it but it's supposedly the fact like uh frodo and sam both added uh, passages to it also yes. or edited it. As, and that comes up if like if there's something that Bilbo like how did Bilbo know what Gollum was doing in this scene and it's like well no because Frodo wrote it down later or Sam wrote it down or maybe just it's invented a little, yeah a little artistic license you know to, to make it yeah. seem like a more compelling or sinister character yeah uh, where was he <laughs> where were we going we're going off on tying up ends tying up ends and all that but to, with with modern technology though like it, it seems odd because there's a, a lot people don't understand about this this whole thing, and yet nobody yeah. seems to be building these mythos out of them. Yeah, nobody well, seems to be having will, as much fun with it. I will point out one sort of realm, and that is there is a realm of sort of spiritual science. I, I'll throw it in a Deepak Chopra does this, and he says everything is energy and everything is quantum, and he he uses the words and he's totally wrong, of course, but. Yeah. The the thing that he uses them for is like this, I don't know this. Uh, this is self empowering philosophy, I suppose, or something like something to that effect, about how you can change the world with your mind and by meditating and things like that. Um, There's that whole transcendental meditation mm-hmm. thing about that, but you don't yeah. see people like running a program on their computer to help get them into the mental state of mind. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that existed. <laughs> but it's not a, a, a thing that you can just do. It's not like, okay, you looked that up on YouTube, and oh, hey, oh, that's the one that you know, got 10 million views on it, and I'll look at that one. Well, no, not 10, mil- ten, ten, not ten million views. So I, it's nowhere near <laughs> popular. I bet you money that there are medi- like Yeah, videos. with like maybe 301 views. <laughs> well, 301 means, means something different on YouTube. Yeah. You know how that works, right? Yeah, but... Uh, but it just it just strikes me because uh, if you look at other types of fiction, they seem to have they seem to be working with the myth, uh, uh, mythos of their own within the fiction, like uh, the Warhammer 40k universe. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, for those who don't know, the human uh, Imperium is not progressing in any technological rate. It's in fact regressing, uh, where once it was a bastion of science and knowledge, of, you know, from the God Emperor himself. Uh, it's regressed. It, guns are, are seen as having spirits. You have to appease the spirits of the gun. Okay. You, in, it's like the holy bolter gun is actually a sacred relic. They don't make them. They don't know mm. how to make them. Yeah. They don't know how to make the big ships that take them from one part of the universe to another. They, they, they're spirits that do that. They go through, they go through the pre-warp rituals, which mm. is really setting the stuff. They don't really know exactly what they're doing. They're just following the rituals of it. Yeah. Well, I in some ways Which I is, like that because it's creepy when you think yeah. about it. Like the the state that you can get that it's not progressing and that people are mistaking you know the routine you have to do for preparation as a sacred ritual for like a magical invocation. Yeah. Well, I like the thought that it's and I think it's plausible that computer programs may reach a level of complexity in which they're simply like a human. I think they might be at this level now, but we assume that they're deterministic and naturalistic and there's nothing supernatural in them. But one human mind can't comprehend everything that a program is doing. So well, in we can't even co- comprehend some of the basic components of our yeah. computers anymore. The last 
human only designed processor I believe was made in 1985 yeah. everything else has been computer assisted since then if not uh, as with recent almost entirely computer designed you might as well use the word spirit for some of the things that computers do I mean it's, I it's mean, misleading that, that fact ways. alone should be able to inspire mm-hmm. a decent story about like the secret lives of computers and technology they are alive they're just pretending not to be to make sure no one panics they're playing the, the, they're playing possum they're keeping on the down low yeah. they've been refining and redesigning themselves in a slow techno singularity since 1985 <laughs> and nobody has realized it ever since well yeah da, 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 da. I, was thinking, I would enjoy reading that story i don't necessarily find it plausible but um, well if you look at the pro, uh, the processors and, and and the chips and all that yeah they're almost wholly computer designed at this point there's very little human input on them anymore. Just some yeah. human giving well, a check. Okay, yeah, we got we got this many more per use, you know, square unit inch. Check. Okay, let's put it out. That's the that's the next uh, generation of Intel. Yeah, well, and obviously I don't know how to manufacture a chip because I don't work for Intel, but um, yeah, even they don't know how to do it. They just rely yeah. on their computers, and then they upgrade mm-hmm. the computers with their new chips to do it again. Uh, Don't tell me that doesn't have a small, just uh, just at least an iota of oh, that's kind of creepy. I, I think there are engineers still to this day who like understand how chips are designed. Well, they know how it, they're designed in but principle, but they can't design them as well as as being designed will, by the computer. Yeah, I mean they need yeah the computer is a necessary tool to create more computers. That's true. <laughs> that's an interesting thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's a, don't tell me that doesn't spook a little creepiness in you and a, a nice uh, grain for a wonderful story. Yeah, I like that. So, I mean, there's clearly all these... The more you look into the history and the development of, of electronics, the more it can seem that, yes, there's a lot there that you just are creepy when because you, you can't understand it all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and that I suppose that opens the door to those cool stories and those myths. No, I do like the occasional story where the supernatural element and the technological element are at odds with each other. Like, uh, I'm not sure if it was ever fully said, but I do believe there's something, uh, there's a reason why in the Harry Potter universe, the muggles have their iPods and their iPads and their Kindle readers and the wizards are still using tomes and they're not just, okay, yeah, I've got 500, mm-hmm. you know, magical tomes on my Kindle here. Ha ha they're using the old stuff and I'm not sure if it was stated because of preference like uh, it's like oh yeah we, we've always done it this way and we kind of like the fashion and the style of it mm-hmm. as opposed to the more technology you bring in the worse or weaker magic gets because I know they've done it in a few settings that technology impedes on, on magic and supernatural and that yeah cross will repel a vampire yeah. nice but you know what else gets rid of vampires showing them your wonderful new iPad <laughs> This technology, this is knowledge. Yeah, keep away, vampire. Which is an interesting thing when you think about it. A little hackneyed in some senses, and if you don't do it just right. Uh, well, I mean, if you were doing comedy, you can get away with it <laughs> as a joke, I guess. I drove a Silas through his heart. <laughs> chunk, chunk, chunk. Now I gotta go to Staples and get myself a new stylus. But at least the vampire's dead for permanent. <laughs> Although a, a stylus is not necessarily that technologically advanced. Well, no, but uh, they're doing some nice uh, new things with it, so that you can get to diff- like a, depending on how you, you twist the one thing, you get to different uh, widths on your pen or your your stylus okay. for that. Mm-hmm. So it is getting more advanced as people realize what they can do with it. But that's just one example, and honestly, I don't know how you'd be able to like drive a blackberry through a vampire's heart. Without yeah. causing a lot of blunt force damage. Um, There's not a lot of pointy, yeah. really sharp pointy things in technology for cutting edge. Um, uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to think of an example of something pointy. Well, that's the thing. is The, the future is apparently rounded edges everywhere. And <laughs> you can sue for that, according to Apple. It's a, a rectangle with, with uh, edges that have been, you know, kind of sanded off. Mm-hmm. That's infringing on our trademark style. We'll mm-hmm. sue you, Samsung. Woo ha ha. Yeah. And uh, okay, mm-hmm. here's some other things I, I like that I've seen for technology. Is the concept of the deeper internet, the internet okay. that you go on, that I go on. Where 
all our readers have found this is on the shallow end of the internet, like the the iceberg part that's above the water. But mm -hmm. uh, there are things that cannot be found by any search engine that you have to enter or find or accidentally link yourself to through you know uh, just this manual entry of the whole thing. Stuff that goes beyond the you know www start prefixes yeah. that will get you into to other areas. Of well, the I internet. think this I think this exists in reality in that it's like the military has their own version, like a parallel. It has version. a parallel, but it's uh, physically removed. Yeah. Uh, that's why Bradley Manning had to get himself a zip drive and copy all those mm -hmm. files before yeah. he sent it over to WikiLeaks. And there will be large companies which will have their own, like, sort of databases and internal internets. But those can be seen like polyps or cysts that grow out yeah. of it on their own. Uh, the deep internet is, is like, it's supposed to be, it's always there, but just unless you know what to look for, you'll never be able to access it. Mm. Maybe for good reason. Apparently <laughs> there's some really cre really disturbing things happening there. Um, some nice potential for uh, for Lovecraftian stuff. I know oh, I there's... Uh, I don't think he actually wrote it himself. I think it was Clark Ashton Smith who came up with Yagoldnak, who just reading his name can cause him to 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 enter in on reality. You don't even have to, to, to say it out loud. You just read it, and it's a potential. And he's got no head, but he's got, like, hands, you know, and he's got the, you know, with mouths in the center of him there and eyes and all that. And he's mm -hmm. like the... Uh, the great old one of, of really creepy perversion. So all of the nasty stuff you wind up getting accidentally linked to because some guy thought, ha, it'd be funny to see if you like this. It's like a shock site, you know, lemon party, yeah. or goatsy. Yeah, don't click those. No, no, yeah, yes, by the way, never, never research any of that or tough girl, any of that sort of stuff. I never advocate that, at least not without two shots of tequila and, and some mental preparation beforehand. Because, my goodness, I have seen things that made me physically nauseous for days on <laughs> end. And that, that wasn't the end. I won't even mention any of that stuff. It's just stuff that, that somebody linked on IRC chat one day. And it's yeah. just, ah. So this is the deep internet leaking into the, <laughs> the real internet. Yes. Uh, that, <laughs> and, and if you were to follow through whatever is connected into there, you can find your way into the secret heart of the internet, deep beyond the even the bowels of 4chan. I like that. That's just like a, like a secret passage within a castle, you know. Oh, and that leads down to the mad scientist lair. It's a digital equivalency, okay. so to speak. Uh, it's like catacombs that run underneath the city. And so, you know, anything you tell about like the city, you know, you like you go down underneath New York City and you find the abandoned sewers and subways and the things that live within there, the chuds, the giant rat swarms, Ooh, and yeah. all things like that. It's, you know, you can have a digital equivalency of that. It's good setting for a story, I suppose. But people don't yeah. seem to work with that. <laughs> well, At that's least not because you need to get it started. <laughs> it always rests on my shoulders, it seems. Yeah. Because there's so much potential there, but I've got a job, i got a wife, i got a kid. i got to sleep sometime. Yeah, and you got a podcast. Yes. A podcast. That's why my Father's Day present, you know, was a nap. <laughs> Just a chance just to rest and relax for like an hour and a half. But, uh, so do you think there there should be this disconnect? Is there something I'm missing from this? Uh, what, we, that what separates the, the supernatural from the technological? Um, should it be, well, should it be, <laughs> is it like left and right hemispheres of the brain? Is there just something ingrained in humanity that says, no, we're going to keep these slightly separate? Or is there something I, I'm not seeing? Like, is there something wrong with my brain and I want to see them collide, but everyone else goes, no, that's horrible, and this is a very basic reason why, and your stories fail forever because of it. Uh, hmm. Well, I mean, there's... I would like to know before I start trying any writing on this sort of thing. Okay. Uh, I think I just... In some ways, I don't care, because all, all I care about is whether it's a good story that comes out at the end. Oh, yes. Ultimately, I believe that should be everybody's concern. Okay. Yeah, so the good story part. And there is a rational resistance to, like, if you if you try and use technology, it's like you're trying to be, trying to use this kind of rational end of reality, this... Um, you're well, you're, you're hoping you're in the rational end of reality. Well, yeah, if you're appealing to technology, you're appealing to things that work and based on science. And well, here's the thing, though. is yeah. I mean, you get the whole thing about, okay, computers are supposed to be complete logic. Yeah. Uh, you start up your computer one day, uh, it won't start up right. What's going on? Uh, you're in the safety mode, it won't boot up properly. So you turn it off. You wait five seconds. You turn it on, everything starts up normally. That's not logic. 
logic is the same input results in the same output. Mm. So you started it up the same way you did the previous time, but now the results are completely different. Yeah. And everyone accepts that as a fact, despite the fact that you know computers are supposed to be logical, and that was technically not a logical thing to do. Mm. That's true. And it could be something like simple like one of the tiny one of the billions of tiny circuits in the computer like maybe burned out or something. It was a one for a zero instead of a zero for a one or anything yeah. like that. And it wouldn't it wouldn't just be that the logic is flawed, it'd be that like maybe there's a physical component in the computer that's But here's the thing different. you don't know what happened and you've just started trying to come up with a reasoning for it. Yeah. Okay. There was a faulty logic gate somewhere in there. Sure. Yeah. But uh, you don't know. And computers for all their logic are very mysterious for us still. They're they're very unknown. Well, unless I guess I suppose you're one of the people that has you know one of the less known operating systems. You're doing like uh, you know Linux uh, type things. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And in which case you're actually booting up and you're recompiling your kernels yourself and all that. In which case, um, God bless you, sir or madam, for taking that extra step of knowledge. Uh, you're braver than I am. I'll stick to my PC, non-Windows 8, thank you. Uh, well, I think there are versions of Linux that you can use fairly simply, like as a novice, but yeah, they'll have their own problems. They have quirks. They have idiosyncrasies. There's no perfect operating system yet. But it's like, when you do run into a problem on those, it's funny because you can get support easier because you can... Well, provided you can get, get your, your computer internet, working, yeah. Yeah, but you can get support and you can get answers to your problems, whereas... Um, Windows, I find, well, I mean, they have their support, but it's often, like, official fixes and stuff that... Honestly, I've gotten more phone calls from people claiming to be from Windows than actually are from Windows trying to help me out. I don't think I've ever had anyone call and say they're from, like, Microsoft or anything like that. Yes, we're from Microsoft. There's a problem going on with your computer. Can you uh, help us out? And it's like, no, I know you guys are <laughs> fake. I have fun with them. I know you're fake. Try and prove it. No, no. C- can you even prove I have a computer in my place? No, no, no. We're, uh, we're all using Macs over here. How can you explain this, sir? And I, just, I have a lot of fun trolling them because I figure, you know what? For every minute I keep them on the line not getting anything from me, that's one minute less of them actually getting to some poor sap's computer stuff even though I am an advocate of uh, knowledge and powers and ignorance should be kind of punished. <laughs> right, okay. But I have my fun. I figure if they're going to give me some hassle, I'll counter-hassle them. I'll make a fun time out of it. Pour myself a bowl of cereal, yeah. have some fun as I'm going about it. Don't even bother being quiet as I'm eating my cereal. Make it all loud and annoying for them too. <laughs> See how bad of a person I can be for just a couple minutes until they hang up on me. Oh, that, you know what? That's a valuable service. I might start a company just to pretend to scam people so that people can get mad at us and you know get their aggression out a little bit. I must admit, it is incredibly therapeutic, <laughs> very cathartic, and and honestly, it's as good as any movie I've seen. Like you watch a good movie and you feel so happy afterwards. You're standing tall. You're you're excited. Nothing like that compares to just getting the scammers and just really just getting there by, by the proverbial short hairs and, and just, just yanking their chain. Yeah, to well, I, I don't know how much damage you're actually doing, but I guess it feels good. Yeah. It feels good to stall them. <laughs> yeah. It feels it feels good to know that, you know, there's no way they're getting anything from you. And I encourage anyone out there who's listening to do the same thing when they try and phone you. Yeah. So, yeah. And if it turns out that it's actually Microsoft, all the better. <laughs> Microsoft will not phone you out of the blue. Yeah. No. So, um, yeah, they, they even state that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Well, it's one of the things they've had to state because of these people. It's like uh, on, on Facebook, the whole rumor, Facebook is going to start charging you $1.35 a month to use their fees. And then now on the Facebook thing, it's Facebook, sign up. It's free now and forever. They had to put the whole it's free now and forever just to stop those damn rumors that are badly true but get circulated because people just don't know any better. Yeah. Well, I wonder, like, do you remember when Hotmail first came out and Hotmail used to say something like free for life? And I bet Microsoft is regretting that now. I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know. They seem happy keeping my free service. I've been a member with them since 97. I don't do as much work with them anymore because, you know, I I can just send off a quick uh, text to this person or that person instead of writing an email. But uh, we still seem to have a good relationship with each other. 
Uh, I don't get annoyed at the stuff they send me for their spam emails, uh, forgetting what's going on new this month. And okay. uh, they let me uh, use the uh, email address for free. So, you know, hey, we both technically win. And it's the only time I ever go onto their part of the news site, honestly. Otherwise, I'm just Google newsing it. But yeah. Uh, Yes, is, is there any particular thing that you've noticed for uh, for any of the fiction where they seem to actually be able to integrate modern technology with supernatural aspects without um, it seeming weird or, like, hackneyed together? So I think The Matrix did some nice work with it, uh, both oh, the yeah. first one and the second one, which I still advocate is a great movie except for the last ten minutes. Right. You cut out those the final ten minutes, and and uh, that's all you really need for the Matrix series. Well, I like the Matrix because um, they don't. It seems to me, and I, maybe it's not this way, but it seems to me like the explanation. They don't quite give a complete explanation of how the Matrix works and what exactly happened. Why they're trying to use humans for a battery when you know? Okay, <laughs> well, let's be honest. They actually do say there's a type of fusion that they're using as well, so they're not relying strictly on human, you know, heat energy. So let's, let's get that out of the air first and foremost. It's not just humans they're using as batteries. Mm-hmm. Um, so I like that the explanation, I mean, there is the possibility of some sort of supernatural stuff, but it also could just be glitches and could just be... Comp- like, see... Well, that's the thing. It's like what we perceive as glitches, you know, and yeah. like deja vu is, is something happening in the Matrix. Yeah. So they've got a mythos. And when you look at the second uh, movie... They've got what are clearly the old classic horror monsters. They were the previous version of the agents in previous iterations of the uh, the Matrix. Oh yeah, yeah, and sure. Yeah, they they weren't the the wonderful you know men in suits that they are now. Yeah, it turns out they they were actually werewolves and Frankenstein's and ghosts and stuff, like those wonderful twins. Everyone loved that. See, and this is what some people say about Scooby Doo is. They liked Scooby Doo because it was always a person in the costume. Because it always, it seemed like it was a supernatural thing, and by the end of the show, it was like, oh, you know, the old it man. It was quite, uh, quite nice to know that, yes, they are actually living in a deterministic, if somewhat weird world, yeah. it where, yes, you know, you can create these 3D illusions of ghost ships using things that are completely just, <laughs> they just pulled the explanation and just, you know, out of their arse, you know, they just, just okay, we got a deadline in five minutes, um, hollow projector with smoke and um, Vaseline on the front, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> and that's what causes it to show up and, and, and move as it does, but no, yeah, still people, still logical, yeah. even if it's a little yeah. nonsensical, um, but every once in a while, I think you've mentioned the movies this before, so tend to go, uh, is some people enjoy a Scooby-Doo story where there really are ghosts, and like that's like, oh wow, that really is. The real zombies magic. were real. <laughs> oh my god, he just ripped a zombie head off. Yeah. So I mean, so there's that aspect to it, but ultimately, yeah, I I think I enjoy a story when it has at least the possibility, if not the strong suggestion, even though it is never explained completely, that it is a naturalistic. You know, it's just a glitch, or it's just. You know, a uh, one got changed to a zero, and that the whole—that's why the ghost appeared. And it's like, <laughs> it doesn't really make sense, but at least they're trying to to say, no, you're still in a deterministic, you know, logical world, and yeah. there's your explanation. You're yeah. welcome. Um, but th- that's not—I don't think it's impossible to make a good story out of just just saying it was magic and that's that, or you know, it was supernatural and or hell well, was full. For, well, <laughs> it does seem that that people will say, okay, your explanation, technology, your explanation, magic, mm-hmm. and I think it was best said on uh, the Christmas episode of the uh, Venture Brothers when they're dealing with the uh, the uh, the Anti Claus, the Krampus, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you know the, uh, uh, the the professor says to the magician. Can't you magic this thing away? And the magician replies, just as easy as you can science it away. <laughs> in which case, it really does make an interesting amount of sense. Magic is not a verb, just as science is not a verb. You can't science something. Yeah. You can do scientific experiments on it, you can uh, analyze it, and you can do stuff to it. But you can't just science something. You can't just magic something. Yeah, that's true. And like, there certain are both quick, easy uh, explanations away for, okay, yeah, science, okay, yeah, magic. 
Yeah, and certain archetypes of wizards in various fiction will be a, a guy who studies very hard and learns how the universe actually works, which is more science-y than magic-y, really. Mm, to a point. Sometimes uh, their explanation for magic is that uh, there are spaceships up in, all, up in orbit that are analyzing mm-hmm. for these particular motions of a mm-hmm. person, and then they produce the effect. It's all the hands-free technology from an age of advanced technology gone by. And so it's not magic. No, they're just teleporting something down for you. Uh, that's cool. I've never uh, heard that explanation. No. but uh, it's a pretty it. interesting one. Um, <laughs> it happens, you know, in the you know post-apocalyptic, you know, what we now have magic sort of explanations. Mm-hmm. So there's that. Yeah. It, well, it's similar to the what I the point I made a little while ago. How you could see like if a gun had enough computer circuits in it and like programs, it could be seen as having a spirit of of a kind. <gasps> But like if a gun had an iPad in it, you could almost. Oh yes, the last thing I want is for my gun to have a, its own Twitter account. So every time I fire it and kill something, you can get tweet. Oh wait, they actually do have something like that now. <laughs> they have a gun that has a scope, and every time you kill something with it, it actually can update on Twitter exactly what you just did. Wow, that's a little frightening, but uh, cool at the same time. Frightening in not the right way is for a nice supernatural horror, but <laughs> frightening is... No, no, that's not what the technology was intended for. It. Knock it off. Well, it'd be interesting if the gun had a, had a glitch and the gun was telling people that it was shooting, or if the gun was sending messages... Every time like you, you aim it at like the, the, the scope at something, it's like, you know, fired at human face today. <laughs> Instead of just yeah. saying aimed at. And it's uploading those, and then the police are like, hmm, this guy seems to be shooting a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> He's shooting, and it seems to be indicating a lot of human bodies here. Maybe we should go talk to him <laughs> with the bulletproof vest on. <laughs> yeah. But and then they, they show up, and he's like, no, I didn't fire it. What? And it's the gun was just... The gun went rogue in its mind. It, the gun was dreaming. The gun was dreaming and went a little crazy. Okay, here's another thing involving Twitter. I, I know they had uh, was a fake person account. It was a computer program that uh, connected with actual people on Twitter and uh, copied uh, somewhat, not perfectly, but uh, took very s- uh, similar things to what they were doing and reposted that. Yeah. And uh, it was uh, supposed to be a jogger, female jogger. And uh, what happened was she uh, wound up posting, oh, I have injured my leg and, you know, like uh, running a sprained ankle. And people were saying, didn't know it was a computer program. And said, oh, I hope you get well soon. And it was actually interacting. It's, it was a person in a group of people in, a, in like mm-hmm. a Twitter circle. And, and people didn't know about it, that it was just yeah. a machine. And here's a nice supernatural element. In the end, it becomes a person. The person was always there and updating it even though the one person set up the uh, the computer program that now no longer exists. Okay. The belief that it was a real person upgraded it to become a real person. <gasps> that's, yeah, that's There's a nice little good. short story with a nice <laughs> twist ending for you. Read right it if yeah. you feel like. Um, link it to us if, if you feel inclined, if you think it's good enough to put up and, and share. I think this, this has interesting implications for the, the Turing test, which is the test that... Um, well, see, that's the thing. Have to look it the up. Turing test, yeah, it, it's uh, you know you're effectively a blindfold test between a computer and a person, and if you can't tell the difference, then congratulations, you've created a new wonderful stage in in computer artificial intelligence. Yeah. However, Twitter is limited to 140 characters, so you can't get it as in depth no. the questioning as the Turing test per would tweet. Per- <laughs> preferably allow per tweet. But you can, you're not limited to number of tweets. So I've seen people do essays, well, small essays on Twitter just by using multiple tweets. Yes, yes, but uh, by and large when you're interconnecting with people saying, oh yeah, I get well soon, you know, it's like, oh, so bad to hear about that, or I finally bit, you know, managed to make that, that full marathon length run you know, this week, hooray, that's all they're doing for tweets. It's, it's not like they're posting their essay of what it's like to run a particular route and then change it or anything. Mm-hmm. So it's not like you can get that depth all the time. And let's face it, some people... Some people would fail a Turing test against another person. <laughs> if you were to have a one person quiz these two people, and you were to tell them one person's a computer, which one? They'd go, oh, this one's definitely the computer here. You could tell this person, this is not even a good program. 
very bad. And the spelling errors they're trying to make to make it look uh, more like a person. Well, it's just yeah. a person who doesn't know how to type or spell. But what no, there I've seen some <laughs> whereby it's like, well, this has got to be almost like a spam bot that just doesn't know what to try and spam. Yeah, or they're twelve. <laughs> <laughs> no, in some cases they're full grown. In well, other yeah, cases, well, I mean, there was an interesting uh, uh, recent occurrence with Donald Trump versus uh, one of the guys who writes for a TV series. And Donald Trump was uh, started off saying, "I warned you against, you know, China. Now everyone's going to have to bow down to them. I was warning you since the 1980s." And the guy responded, "Then why are you making all your clothes there?" And he showed has a nice attachment to a link that actually shows uh, Donald Trump's wear made in China. <laughs> <laughs> and he calls him out on being a hypocrite. And then Donald Trump's responses were the same thing pretty much every time. What a know-nothing. What a this. You know, and it's the same insult back and again and again. Mm-hmm. And the guy kept coming back with insults like, uh, okay, you tried insulting me this way. How about I insult you a new way this way? Mm-hmm. And so that's two new insults to your one back again. And he kept doing that. And Donald Trump just got verbally smacked down. Just, oh, it was delicious smackdown. It was not even a fair fight sort of thing. Um... Uh, beautiful stuff uh, in terms of reading it uh, I'm sure Donald Trump wouldn't say it's beautiful stuff he was oh this guy is trying to get some attention off of me because I'm the Trump yeah that sounds right but uh, if you were to look at that and you were not to know who's what and you were to say one of these people is a computer which one and the guy would go um, well it seems to be they're having an argument and opponent one here is utilizing the same insults time and again I think uh, it's number one is the computer opponent and you really need to beef up his insult list uh, for, for <laughs> files you know what I, I think that stubbornness in some ways is a hum- is more human quality I mean yes computers can be stubborn and repeat over and over again um, that's a characteristic of computers but I would say that's equally that can be human because like basically if you get backed into a corner like if you said something stupid and someone calls and let's let's face it Donald Trump is not the first time he said something stupid on Twitter here (laughs) yeah exactly Um, I mean when I say something stupid I try and like own up to it and try and say oh yeah okay that was dumb Perhaps I did not uh, give proper clarification (laughs) from my position. Let me reiterate (laughs) and uh, give perspective. Well, it it might not (laughs) even be like if I if I said and I'm not putting like I'm saying this is very possible that I can say something so incredibly stupid. There's no way of getting out for out of it except just saying, nope, that was stupid. I shouldn't have said that. I didn't even mean it, and I never will mean it. But for some reason, I'm not sure. Maybe, I'm not sure why, but I said... So, it was a brain fart. Mm-hmm. I guess you could say it's a brain fart. Yeah, that's one way. Um, but if you try and finesse out of something really stupid, you'll end up just being like, I don't know, repeating yourself. You just, just uh, dig in the, in the hole a little deeper, as the same. Yeah, yeah. Where I know a few times when I've done some uh, coding on Dwarf Fortress, people were saying, well, why didn't you just do it this way? It's a lot easier. Uh, and I go... I'm trying to work it this way where you're not modifying you know, more files. It's more of just an addition to. Mm-hmm. And then people say, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to do. This is uh, from a very simplistic modding standpoint. I understand you now. That's, yeah, okay, this works fine from what you were trying. Yeah. So sometimes a little explanation from where you're coming from does give a lot of perspective. Because, yes, it would have been easier for me just to say, add this class reaction, and you modify it in these five different folders, or these five different files here, and that'll work perfectly. Mm, If you don't have any coding experience, it can be a little intimidating. So I tried to come from, okay, no, just add this in to all the files you've got. Just add this new file, and it all works perfectly. And they said, oh, I understand. You don't know what you're doing. No, they go, (laughs) okay, okay, I I understand. It's, It's a more simplistic modding style you're trying. Okay, uh... I understand. We prefer it this way, but yes, this it also works. And that's one of the fun things about modding in Dwarf Fortress is that uh, there's not just one way to make it work. Sometimes there's two or three different ways to get the result you want. Oh yeah. Well, I think that's generally how it, how coding works. So I mean, you're learning, and and I'm uh, on a I similar think, level. So. I think any good system should have that uh, uh, effectively redundancy, provided it doesn't bloat the system too much. Yeah. Well, and just basically code programming languages tend to have multiple ways of, of doing things. I mean, it's yeah. just how, I think it's kind of how reality works in a way. Just yeah, there's a lot of different ways to come at it, and it does help out, because if you can't work it the one way, just try it with the way you're more familiar with. So, best, we're getting off track a little bit again. <laughs> we're talking about supernatural stuff. Um, well, how long have we been going? Uh, 
we have been going for 70 minutes. 70 minutes? Okay, okay. So we got we still got time to, to cover all the basics. Uh. Yeah. So what do you think about, uh, though, I mentioned it before, the antagonistic style. Supernatural is opposed to the logical nature of modern technology. Uh, that that the supernatural requires, and maybe, maybe, maybe it does have some explanation on scientific thing, but it requires quantum uncertainty. So that when you're in a situation where everything's being monitored, where everything's being watched, you can't, magic can't happen. You can't do magic in front of a camera. Not real magic. It's mm -hmm. all sleight of hand there. Real magic can't be done with where, where people can watch and then later study you, what's, what's going on. Yeah, that in particular doesn't satisfy me because, um, I don't know. It just doesn't seem uh, like a cohesive whole. It seems more like competing ends. Uh, it... it Actually, it seems to me like the the people in the story are simply serving the fact that they're in a story, because if it if it's magic in that sense, it's like well, this is a plot device. Then it's like just in the people and the characters in the story is saying, yeah, okay, we're st we're story characters, we're not real. This is just to get us to the next thing. And uh, well, then how about if they work uh, parallel? You know, they don't join. But uh, why do vampires not show up in mirrors, and thus by extension, do not show up in photographs? or in videotapes, well, they're supernatural, and that requires at least some technological aspect. In this case, mirror, I guess, is a technological thing. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, it took a lot of time before we got mirrors right. Because it's crafted by humans? Well, it, it, takes, a, it takes a yeah. lot of work to get it right, and for most of human history, we're actually just looking at properly beaten brass and getting the best reflection you could out of that. Yeah. Yeah, polishing. The mirror that you and I know today, and all of the, the people listening know, is a completely different thing from historic glass. So, okay. Yeah, so don't take that for advantage. Just because it's something you see everywhere doesn't mean it's not high end stuff. This is something that took a lot of time to perfect people. So, yes, uh, the va and vampires don't show up this way because they're supernatural, and thus uh, they, they have a hard time interacting with technology because they are on a different, uh, we'll say, effective wavelength. They're on the supernatural wavelength rather than the technological wavelength. Hmm. Does that satisfy at all, or does that still seem uh, different or, uh, you know, separate? Uh, it, it, well, I mean, it's, hard, it's really hard to say because I can imagine a story being told where I still enjoy the story, and it's just like, it, we're just going to hand wave this and say science and technology are different, and that would be fine for me. However, that element in particular, isolated, does strike me as, like, it doesn't feel right in my gut. It's like, no, I want the story to be consistent and to be like, you know, supernatural things work and scientific things work, and somehow there's an interaction, somehow. So then you'd be okay with uh, somebody, like, videotaping, uh, like a wizard casting a spell, and then later on playing that back on their iPod and having the spell happen again? Hmm. They hold it up, yeah, okay, I'll just put this uh, fireball casting one on repeat, mm -hmm. just put it here, and uh, that's our protection from this entrance, so let's go guard another entrance. My temptation would actually be to say that there's, well, I would probably invent something that got missed in the iPad, maybe it's, because... Um, you I actually mean, do need the physical gestures, or you actually need a, an actual person doing it, the videotape isn't enough. I I think so, but I'm not sure what exactly what aspect it would be. So yeah, cause otherwise, because if these things aren't separate, you wind up having these weird, you know, confluences where okay, I've got an automaton that that goes through the motions. It's not an intelligent being, but it still you know can say the right things thanks to you know the speaker box and yeah. motion its hands the right way thanks to you know all the pre-programmed stuff. And yes, now I have an automatic fireball caster. What a la la. Hmm. Yeah, well, I I could see that being done. That'd be kind of that'd be interesting. I, uh, like, of course, this does sound like it's coming from a player abuse standpoint, from like a, a game. Yeah, if you were playing in a vi in a role playing game and you were creating that, like as your like I don't know to get around the rules, yeah, the DM is within his rights to say uh, knock it off, <laughs> something like that. You're not yeah. allowed to do this. I don't know why it doesn't actually stay in the rules, but I'm saying no. Knock it off. But, I mean, if if you're in the more loosely constrained world of fiction writing, then you, sure, why not? Sure. Like, let the automaton cast... Uh, whatever the magic is was being <laughs> cast by, you know, the whatever it does for the magic yeah. thing. And But, I mean, D&D &D has that also um, sort of stimulated in terms of, like, magic items and wondrous items. Like, 
you can create a wondrous item that casts a spell, and it's like this much, you have to invest money into developing it and researching it and materials and stuff. But So in this case, it would be like Arcano research for the, the, the combination of the two to, to get the proper, you know, you got to spend the time to code everything properly and you got to invest in the uh, the many little gears that, yeah, that the make the fingers work a lot of the right way. Yeah. Not bad, not bad. I can see that working from a game po- uh, play standpoint. Um, so then you don't, uh, you're, you're a fan of... Uh, having them be together but not with a significant amount of overlap um well okay here's here's what what I'm ultimately a fan of okay I'm I'm a fan of ultimate rational explanations even if they might be hidden or you don't ever actually get to them I like the the thought that the the wizard's gesture somehow has a connection to reality and somehow works through actual like Real, somehow, um, I don't know. There's there's uh, uh, an explanation that can be studied and, and yeah. reproduced. Yeah, that you could reproduce it. You could videotape it. Um, maybe replaying the videotape wouldn't work, but maybe if you did a hologram or oh, that redid it or something like that, then it would work. Because it had to be three dimensions or something like that. Ah, the manipulation <laughs> of the points throughout three dimensions as it mm-hmm. creates so what is effectively a fifth dimensional object that causes this to... It's a fifth dimensional <laughs> funnel that develops the, the energies through and that's why you got lightning. That's that's what really happened. Yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, and I can forgive a little bit of fudging too of the laws of physics for the sake of an yeah. interesting story. Oh, well, I mean, <laughs> any story should be willing to sacrifice at least one or two laws of physics <laughs> if it means a good, uh, better storytelling experience. Yeah, uh, yeah I think so. Preferably yeah. the minor laws of physics, I- ideally, because then people don't get so angry. You fail to obey the law of thermodynamics. I hate you. Yeah, and disobeying the law of gravity is is always fun because then you can get flying islands and flying mi- Superman. <laughs> well, see, here's the thing, is... Uh, Back when I was young, they had a wonderful expo in the uh, hockey rink once a year. They got all the ice out of there, which was a good thing. You, you want fresh ice every once in a while anyways. Okay. But they had everybody put in their stuff, and there's a nice little thing, and you go around seeing what all the people are doing, and they're trying to you know, hook you up with uh, this stuff and that stuff. And there was one thing. There was a, a water company. It was like, a, like they're trying to sell you know, like the, the water stuff. You, know, you put it up, you get your fresh water. Mm, yep. No hard water here. It's purified in reverse osmosis. Um, and what they had for a nice display was it was a giant tap in the air that would, was always rushing water down. Yeah. And for years, I'd go there and I'd look at it trying to figure out, one, where is all this water coming down from? And two, yeah. how is that tap staying up in the air? <laughs> and in the end, spoiler alert, um, what it is is there's a tube of water inside pumping up and then it yeah. comes down and that the tap itself is just like a, a fixture on the top yeah and so the whole thing works not like a tap hanging from the air but it's like a lamp post really you just set it up anywhere the water pumps up but you don't see the water going up because it's obscured by the water outside of it coming down yeah yeah it's a fun little uh, thing and so from that what you could do if you had enough money and you know uh knowledge in, in architecture, you could create a wonderful thing in, we'll say Las Vegas, that has all these wonderful floating islands with wonderful, uh, like, uh, just a, yeah, waterfalls off of several corners on each end, and it looks oh, beautiful, and people can be cool there. Idea. And, yeah, it's all being structurally held up by these new age technology, you know, stuff, like <laughs> clear age. plastic, well, the high end, really, yeah, yeah. the really good yeah. plastics, the stuff you couldn't get back in the 80s. And that's holding up these wonderful floating islands. <laughs> and the whole thing looks wonderful and it's like a magical land. But no, no, it's all just being held up. That's so cool. you don't actually need that. A wonderful amount of knowledge and a little bit of imagination can actually get you a long way. But that It'd be uh, like Avatar Land or something. Well, I don't know. I suppose they'd have <laughs> uh, some nice stuff up there. You get, I don't know, maybe some... Some nice bur- Heck, it'd be a nice misted area in Las Vegas. That I'm sure won't get people in. But you could have nice little casino stuff there, uh, you know, and bubble island sort of thing. You played up like a James Bond sort of like villain hideout sort of thing. It could be pretty yeah. awesome. Uh, <laughs> I'm just snowballing ideas at this point. <laughs> just yeah. off okay. of a little fragment I know and then but applying it on a larger balling. scale. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's right. I guess I have to be spitballing because you're not going to have snow in Vegas. 
<laughs> not for long, anyways. I think it does every once in a while, but yeah, it doesn't. Ah, uh, a few times, a decade at most, I believe. It's a wonderful desert land there, and I encourage yeah. everyone to visit at least once. And they're not paying me to say that; I just actually believe it. Um, but yeah, that's a nice way to explain some stuff off. But I do like the concept of uh, of there isn't the rational explanation. I like Zalgo, which is a uh, one of the uh, horrible things created on the internet to explain, uh, well, nothing in particular. They just take a photo of something and then they make it really freaking creepy with bleeding eyes and horrible things opening up Mm -hmm. and weird voices saying, he comes, he comes, he comes. And it's just really creepy. Explanation? Reason? Not really any. (laughs) And I I, I dig that on some degree. As much as my logical mind likes to, to get everything together and try and understand it, no, it fails, and I somewhat enjoy that. It's, it's yeah. being able to let go of, of the tight grasp I usually have on logic. Yeah, well, if, if you couldn't do that, you wouldn't have any fiction at all, because fiction, by its very nature, is stuff that never happened. Well, yes, but uh, it it's usually sets itself up within the realm of plausibility. Yeah. So even if this has never happened... It might be able to happen. With Zalgo, no. The Red Worm has been defeated. He shall come. And then all of a sudden, like a big crack opens up on the top of some guy's head and a giant mouth opens up. Completely against any laws of biology, uh, laws of reality, and why the open head is screaming he comes when there's no brain inside there but just an infinitely deep mouth when you look in. That's just how it goes. Explanation? There is none. Quit trying to be so logical. Just get a little creeped out. Although, well, the explanation, I mean, there is one place where um, strange things happen, and that is... In Again, <laughs> Vegas. But you know, that tends to be explained with that uh, drugs and all that. Um, but, well, it's going to go towards, like, dreams and different, like, psychological experiences, because you can have, you can experience something that doesn't make any sense, like, like people with mouths on the top of their heads or, <laughs> you know... Everything going suddenly very, very weird. Or someone turning into another person. And um, for some reason, our brains are like, yeah, no, that's a dream. <laughs> well, you know, it is yeah, basically hallucinating for several hours every night. Sometimes you get amnesia afterwards, sometimes you don't. Yeah. But uh, yeah, shoot. Uh, I think uh, Ebenezer Scrooge explains stuff like that away interestingly enough. Because uh, some people do have very logical dreams. Some people in their dreams will wind up actually doing logical things and progressing and, and like continuing the work they were doing while they were awake. Yeah. Um, and that uh, sometimes a bad, crazy dream is from undigested food, indigestion, and other physical ailments. And that's, yeah. that's what causes the crazy dreams. There's more of gravy than of grave about you. <laughs> it's utilized a wonderful uh, turn of phrase. Uh, Good yeah. wordplay. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, that's the explanation for it. And sometimes mm, there's drugs involved. Sometimes you're just having a mental breakdown. It, it really be. depends on the person and the circumstances going around. But I, I also like to imagine, and I, I don't think we're at this point in in technology yet, but um, they, who uh, Carl Jung sort of started trying to decode all these elements that we fi- do find in our dreams and finding out, because if like basically in a dream one person can become another person or you can be watching a person in in one moment and then suddenly you're you are that person like switching the perspectives yeah which is by the way apparently bad storytelling switching from mm-hmm. first person to third person but all right yeah, for your so dreams you tell the dreams that what's the difference going on there yeah. topic for another time i suppose and and this is what he tra- Carl Jung tried to figure out with his archetypes is like what exactly does the brain see as, like, your unconscious brain see as reality and necessary for continuity, or can it just, just suddenly everything is, because it, it's not chaotic, it, like, things in your dreams seem to have meaning. Well, right? sometimes <laughs> they do, sometimes they don't. Uh, there is an instance whereby, um, through mental disorder, or sometimes being bombarded by radiation in the right way, you can have the brain that associates you with you to malfunction. Mm-hmm. And so you'll wind up with uh, things uh, they call shadow man, where you see a shadow out of the corner of your eye, and you think of that as a person. Or you start yes. stop thinking of you as a person, and you say, oh no, I'm just a hollow shell. I don't matter anymore. I'm not real. And what turns out is a part of your brain is on the fritz. You had a minor stroke, or 
the government is bombarding you with select radiation that's yeah. shorten that part out. Um, they have tested it, by the way. Well, and that but causes these problems. And so you, the aspect of who is a person and who is not can be explained in that way. So it's not necessarily about how you envision it. It might just be your brain is uh, short-circuiting, so to speak. Yeah, well, your brain somehow develops the concept of a person or, like, a personality contained within a body and that being, like, that being somehow meaningful rather than just everything being white noise. Like, that's that's a possibility. Like yes, the, body, the, the very fact that you're able to look around and see things as things and not just as a random assortment of colors and, and heck, not even being able to perceive shapes because let's face it, for all we speak of, we are technically not looking at things in three dimensions. It's yes. like 2D plus 1. We're able to get some depth out of it, but yeah. we can't see all sides of, of a thing inside and outside. That's true 3D, yeah. and we're not looking at that that way. And so the fact that we're able to actually perceive things like that is one of the huge stumbling blocks as to why we can't get machines to look at things and see items the same way we can. Yeah, uh, like our top men are working on it, though. Yeah, they're working on it, and they're they're probably making good progress. I'm they're <laughs> making progress. I wouldn't say good progress because yeah. uh, you know everyone's saying, "Oh, we're supposed to have intelligent computers by now." So good, but let's face it, any progress is good progress at this point. Oh yeah, I'd say so. Yeah, creepy running machines, be damned. If you've ever seen those things, though, like the robots that run, <laughs> like the the big dog, that one. They they look like a skinned animal running around. That's creepy. Yeah, I think it's I think it's big dog. Man, put a blanket over that thing before you <laughs> show the rest of the world. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's weird that because it all it is is a it's a machine, but it's in the shape of a weird animal. So that for some it reason it looks to me, people. It, have it doesn't look like a big <laughs> dog to me. It looks like a headless, skinless, fake muscled cow <laughs> running around, or a horse, or even something. It's a, Oh, oh, I just, uh, I, I mean, sure, it's wonderful technology. Look at it, it's wandering, it's going up, it's going faster than you can, it's carrying things, it's yeah. going across the woods. Still looks like a skinned, headless animal to me. And ew. There's <laughs> something to be said about, dude, get an artist on your team, have him help fix things <laughs> up, and then display it to the world. I don't know, I, I really like the, um, the skinned well, animal look. Here's the thing, though, is it, uh, one of the key things that... Uh, the i series does with with Apple is it looks good. It does things good. They're not necessarily pioneers in what they're doing, but they make it look really, really sweet, really desirable. Yeah. And well, they don't make it look like anything though. They make it look no, but it, they make sure it has the aesthetic appeal to it. It's got yeah. this curved edges. It seems very yeah, sleek and good and ratios, I guess. Yeah, they use the golden ratio in and there. it's just very clean on yeah. the back, and they got the one symbol on there. And then you yeah. look at. The skinless, headless cow beast. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if I suppose if they were going to market, like, mass market these things, they would probably round the corners off a little bit. But how much more would you be able to get for funding if you had this sleek style design? It's a silver cow, headless, still kind of beast, but it's all sleek and silver covered. It looks just magnificent. You would get yes, people throwing money at you. You would get people starting Kickstarters just to donate it to you. I just for more crazy know. cow things, man. It's <laughs> awesome. You can do that now, eh? I don't well, know. Like, maybe not Kickstarter. Maybe more of an Indiegogo type thing. I know cats can get, like, millions of hits on on YouTube just by putting up a cat video, but the question is, can you turn that into actual money? <laughs> uh, yeah, there's some ways to monetize it. Not enough effectively to make an industry out of it. Yeah, we're looking Thank at my cat right now. You could be a star. Well, here's the thing. I'm just picturing, like, what if they were to come up with a smaller equivalent of, of, of the running, you know, beast? Would you like your cat as much if it had no head, no tail, and what was effectively no skin? Just a small version of that moving animal just to wander around and be like your cyber pet? Because let's face it, that'd, those, be, that'd be great. It would be kind of <laughs> creepy when you stumble on it late at night. You, you wake <laughs> up, you go to the bathroom, all of a sudden, chop, 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 and it comes marching down at <laughs> you. Well, you're still half asleep. Yeah, that's not going to be, oh, I love you sort of thing. And there is a reason why all those cyber pets look good. They're not like not see-through hollow or anything like that. They make sure to put the skin on and make it look like a dog or a cat, or at least make it look like a smooth hockey puck for the Roomba. Well, Which I'll claim is technically kind of like a pet, if, except that it cleans your carpets instead of getting hair in them. As long as it, it didn't leak, and well, an animal often will, will shed and 
uh, do with all its animal things. But imagine, like, if if I had a robotic pet, as long as it didn't leak and seep over stuff, I think I'd be happy with almost any shape. I don't Even the skinless <laughs> style? Well, I suppose if it looked like like muscles and stuff, that might be a little creepy. Or if it had, like, a, a big lidless eye that always is open and a, a mouth that hung open with teeth sticking out. Like, you know the, the ugliest dog in the world picture you, you see? Yeah, yeah. Um, if it looked like that only. But here's the thing: is most of the machines that they, they come up with, it doesn't look like any one given animal. It looks yeah. vaguely like a cow, vaguely like a dog, but not close enough to be either. So it looks like a, almost like a, some sort of unknown beast was skinned and then you know chop, had its head chopped off and it's still moving around. So I imagine whatever animal they first come out with, unless they specifically design it to look like a dog or a cat, maybe even a lizard of some sort, it'll wind up looking. Close. It'll be the uncanny valley, close to a creature, but far enough mm. away that it's kind of creepy. Mm. Yeah. So, and for that reason, why is this auto automatic animal that we're talking of having teeth? Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's specific, supposed to be biting something. Like it's it's actually a mouse here. I don't want it to have teeth. Okay. Well, I was saying I wouldn't want it to have teeth. Yeah. So That's I mean, true. I guess there's my line in the sand. <laughs> Unless there's a reason for it to have teeth. I am, if it yeah. comes to technology, it's supposed to have that thing. <laughs> so, oof. Jeez, now I'm not going to have that creepy, skinless, headless cat thing running around in my mind. Oh, tonight. should we leave our listeners with that image? Because we've been... Uh, but see, there's an interesting thing going back to the supernatural. Okay. Is uh, this, this, this cutting edge of technology, these moving mobile uh, beasts going to work great for the military so you don't have to haul around like 150 pounds of crud with you. Yeah. You can move nice and light and the uh, the... Your pa or effective neo pack mule will carry it for you. Yeah, and that's great. But it still looks almost like a headless, creepy animal. It looks almost like what you'd expect out of mythology. You know, uh, like like a vampire. You know, comes from a dead body. This is, comes from like a dead animal. It's it's the dead animal that follows you around carrying your stuff. So they should put that in. Like somebody should write a story with. The, with the big dog as like an actual pet that, or not well, a pet well there's, and you could work it a couple different ways you could work it as you could take the concept of it and move it back in time saying you know the old mythologies of, of you know the uh, the way the way you know we'll, I hate to do this but we'll say like one this one ethnic group that no longer exists used to have this the ritual they chop off the head and skin it and the animal would still move mm -hmm. and you know that's a nice creepy way. And congratulations, you got a new monster for D and D. Yeah, 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 yeah. Or you could take it another way and saying that uh, the creatures aren't actually as smart as they seem. The technology for for making sure it moves isn't there. What they do is they put the brain of like a cow or a dog in there, and that's oh, the yeah. neural processor. Or you could take it full hog, so to speak, and just say uh, no. They sacrifice it and they imbue its spirit within this thing, and that's how come it's able to move. It's like a, a Golem, you know, it's just ah. it's being animated through the soul of some unfortunate beast. That's cool too. Three different, yeah. uh, equally valid stories for telling, I yeah. think. Yeah. Out of just one cutting edge thing, but no one seems to be doing this. Why is it up to me? Why is it on my shoulders? Am I the only one seeing this? I, it oh. might, it might be out there. Like I, I don't read enough of the it's, latest. Well, it's not the big thing because let's face it, you get a good creepy story out there. People are going to start saying, "Oh, have you read this story? It's so messed up. It's so creepy. You'll never look at it the same way again." And that's ideally what any good story should have people saying. You'll never think of it in the same way again. Very good. Uh, well, so we're about ready to wrap things up. I just want to remind our listeners that we have an email address, thesimulationist at gmail dot com. And you can also leave comments on the YouTube channel and the, um, the iTunes reviews. And the blog has a comment section, too, that you can use. And We're on Facebook. So, yes, if you, if you can come up with a real good example, like this author's really just put something out, we'll definitely link that around. We'll definitely show that up because, hey, we kind of like being proven wrong on this sort of stuff. Like, why isn't this happening? It is. It just hasn't hit the big stream yet. And we like to do what we can to help usher it along into the mainstream. <laughs> That we do. That we do. Because, you know, we're just good guys that way. So send us a line. Prove us wrong. Show us uh, what <laughs> you've got. Maybe maybe you're a better author than I am. Or, you know, I'm just an idea man, as it turns out, maybe. you can, If you're able to write it up and you think it's something good, we'll link it. Very good. 
Okay, well, uh, I've been Josh Levin. I've been Ryan Kirkby, and watch out for the deep uh, parts of the internet. That's right. Send us money. <laughs>